Welcome to Mill Valley Film Festival. I'm Melanie Nichols, CFI Education Program Manager. I'd like to introduce Marsha Jarmel and Ken Schneider, who produced and directed the film Los Hermanos, The Brothers. Marsha and Ken are partners in Patchwork Films. With 20 plus years experience and nine years working in Cuba, Patchworks focuses on character-driven stories that illuminate social issues. Los Hermanos, The Brothers, is Patchwork's eighth collaboration, their fourth in Cuba. Previous films include Speaking in Tongues, Havana, Havana Curveball, The Return of Sarah's Daughters, Born in the USA, and several short films. Welcome, Marcia and Ken. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Marcia. Excited to be here. So how did your relationship with Cuba begin? Well, our family story in Cuba begins in 1941, when my father, who had been a World War II refugee, got on a ship with his surviving relatives, his mother and grandmother, with the intention of joining their surviving relatives in the US. But the ship stopped in Havana, and they planned on stopping there to take care of their visas and their, get their paperwork in order, and then join their relatives in the New York area and that was December 1st, 1941. And six days later, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And we all know what happened then. But what we don't all know is among the, the moves of President Roosevelt was to seal the borders and uh, not accept any refugees from anywhere. So my father and grandmother and great grandmother lived in Havana for several years from 41 to 43. And dad told that story at our dinner table. And of course, the Cuba that he encountered in the 40s was very different from the one that those of us who've been there have encountered since. But it was part of our family lore. And uh, many years later, um, we made a film in which my dad's story figures. And that film was Havana Curveball. How did you first come to hear about the Lopez Gavilan brothers and want to tell their story? We had been back and forth to Cuba many times in the course of making Havana Curveball and were very taken by the art scene there and we're drawn more to the, the cultural space than the political space. And we were looking for stories to tell and we were looking to make a short a series of short films about arts in Cuba and what and how they manifested because we Americans know that you know Cuba has a dance culture and they have a music culture but, but when we think of Cuban music they think of uh, popular music and what I didn't know was that Cuba also has a very strong visual art and photography culture and everything all manifestation of art there it's 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 in the the warp and weft of, of Cuban life and we were introduced, well actually I was at a, the Cuban Jazz Festival, Havana Jazz Festival opening night, and I saw Aldo, who's the, at the time was a young pianist, who eventually became one of the main subjects of our film, and I saw him play, and I was completely blown away, and I'm kind of a music person, I'm not a musician, but I'm a lover of music, and I'd never seen or felt anything like it, and um, I brought this idea back to Marsha and we talked about it and said, well, this is a great musician, but it's not necessarily a story. And soon after that, Aldo um, sent his brother Ilmar, who through his own life journey had ended up in the New York area and he's a violinist. And he sent Ilmar to see one of our short films about a Cuban dancer, which was playing in New York. And we met Ilmar um, before the screening and it, was there was instant karma between Marsha and Ilmar and I. Mm -hmm. And Ilmar said over breakfast, oh, by the way, you know that all was coming in six weeks, right? We're going to have our first ever tour of America because Obama has made political changes and Aldo can finally come and play. And Marsha and I looked at each other and said, you know, light bulb went off. Okay, there's a story. Two brothers, two nations kept apart by geopolitics and they're going to come together and create beautiful music. And like with a lot of films, you don't know what you're getting into. We certainly didn't. But once we literally got on the bus, which was their tour bus, we were on it for good. And that was uh, about four years ago. And what, what do you think it is that makes Cuban music so unique, that, um, you know, that influences? 
So um, I can't speak so much to Cuban music as a whole because Cuba has been a crossroads of many cultures, but I can tell you that their music is a fascinating mix of um, Western classical music, Latin jazz, American jazz, um, and uh, Afro-Cuban rhythms, um, which is something that is distinctive in Cuban music, all of Cuban music. Um, but in, in their classical music, you've, you feel it's in that space between jazz and, and what we think of as classical. Um, and it has all of those influences that you can hear. How has the political relationship between the U.S. and Cuba changed since you've, so you've been going there for nine years? Our first trip was in 2011, yes. 2011. Um, so how have you seen it change? I know that in 2011, it was, you know, the opening, Americans were going en masse. Every airline seemed to have multiple flights to Cuba. And, uh, you know, it was a, such a beautiful time. How has it changed in the ensuing years? Yeah, so uh, that's what you said is correct. The, the actual real sea change date was 2014, not 2011. Um, mm -hmm. In 2011, Obama made an announcement that made it a little easier to do things between the two countries. But in 2014 is when he really made a, a public speech and Raul Castro in Cuba made a similar speech, which basically said, we're going to begin the process of normalizing relations, which was very vague. but. For those of us who have been watching Cuba and had, had projects in Cuba or traveling Cuba is a big deal. And those next two years were, we saw that flowering you're talking about where Americans went there as tourists, as researchers, as lovers of the arts, um, as artists, and Cubans were able to come here uh, and you know play concerts in, in Florida area or in New York or in Aldo's case to have a tour because he was connected to Ilmar's project. And that really was a sea change. So 2014 to 2016, the last two years of the Obama administration was, um, was a, a moment that we hadn't seen before. And uh, the new administration, when President Trump was elected, he made very strong statements that he was going to undo this, which he did in short order. So in 2017, it became much more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult. Uh, uh, there were less flights, it became costlier, for all those part and other Cubans, for them to get here, they had to find an American embassy to issue them a visa. And remember that our current administration shut down the embassy in Havana, which Obama had opened. So that was a sea change in the other direction. So, for example, uh, we had a, a, a meeting with Aldo scheduled in which we were going to talk about the original compositions he was going to write for our film. And we booked tickets and we were planning to go there and about a week before we got on a plane, we got a call saying, uh, I had to fly to Mexico City to go to the US Embassy there to get my visa for a trip coming up next month. So I won't be in Cuba the time you're going to be there. So there was a general uncertainty about anything related to our two countries, travel, exchange. People who had invested in business suddenly found their businesses not happening. Um, so that was the last big change was in 2017. And right now, again, it's not impossible to go, but it's much harder, it's much more expensive, and you have to jump through more hoops in either direction. Mm -hmm. And it is much harder for our Cuban friends and, and colleagues to come here. Mm -hmm. what, what do you, go ahead, Mark. Just, uh, just jump yeah. in because I, I, I'm not sure everyone understands what the starting point of, of this is. And I just think it's worth explaining that in 2011, and still all this time, there's been an embargo between uh, the U.S. has placed on Cuba, which means that, in essence, it's illegal for Americans to spend any money in Cuba, which makes it pretty much impossible to go there unless you have a special uh, uh, permission. And there was, um, and and that's been in place since shortly after the uh, the revolution in in the early '60s, um, and uh, it's. Uh, it, it got a little bit better during that time when there was the opening and maybe a lot better for some people. Um, and then, and now it's really, it's very, very difficult times there now. As I understand it, the 
arts were a, a pillar of the original revolution in Cuba. Um, can you say how the arts uh, being so important for you know this many years has influenced their culture? Well, I think uh, Cuba always had a really strong culture and a strong sense of national identity. But I think uh, with the revolution, it became a kind of um, core belief, like other countries might um, repre them, represent themselves internationally in, other, in many ways. But for Cuba, it's always been in the arts. Um, they, their musicians and dancers and um, filmmakers have, have always been ambassadors around the world. So it's, um, they have, uh, and, and it's, um, you can feel it there that um, the arts are available to anyone. You can go see the opera or the symphony or the uh, national ballet for the price of a soda. It's, it's mm -hmm. really accessible. Um, so the arts are, are very foundational, I think, in the way um, even people who don't have a lot of resources or, or um, you know, didn't get to go to university, people partake in the arts. And every kid has an opportunity to uh, experience it as part of their education. So it's, it's pretty central to um, their idea of what it means to be Cuban. I would add one more thing to that, Melanie, um, that it, one thing that's been helpful to me is to think of Cuba 60 years after their transition, their revolution, to think about where our own country was mm. in the early days uh, of its revolution and not, not getting into the morass of, of politics and what works and what doesn't work. That's a whole other Zoom conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm imagining that, you know, in the early days, in the heady days of the colonial period, whether it was Betsy Ross sewing a flag or, you know, a few years later, Herman Melville writing Moby Dick, you know, the, the story of the nation was being written and sewn and sung by those early generations of artists. And even for um, our Cuban friends who don't identify as political, they are still operating in a place where it's a new nation. And there's and for them, patriotism means something very different. Your love of country and love of country's history means something very different. Um, so it is, uh, I think, artistic expression has been since the beginning of the, the new uh, new nationhood, you know, 19, January 1st, 1960. It's been, um, it's been in, the, in the DNA of the nation. And it's a it's a tiny country. There's 12 million people there, and um, they have really an outsized influence in the arts. What's the best way for U.S. students to find out about Cuban music? Well, I think there's classical, there's jazz, there's a, a lot of different kinds of music coming out of Cuba. Is it is it accessible? It's, it's completely accessible. It's accessible on, on Spotify and um, you know iTunes and whatever. And I would recommend, not to toot our own horn, um, we have a, a listen page on our website that has links to a lot of music and a lot of music videos, uh, both of our, our brothers, but also of, of um, other people in their family. And, and that can really take you down a, a garden path to a lot of great music. And do you know if the brothers have any plans to get together again? Is it all just kind of on pause because of uh, COVID? And of course, not to mention the difficulty of the political situation. But. I, I think they, they very much have an aspiration to, um, to do a project that would just be the two of them. They did uh, put out an album, which um, uh, in part, uh, includes music from the film. Um, and I think their idea was to tour with that, but between the difficulty of getting visas and now the difficulty of traveling at all, that's kind of on, on pause. Um, but we are hoping with the film that there'll be opportunities for them to appear virtually. Ah, that would be wonderful. Melanie, can I, can I just add oh, yeah, please. one more thing? Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about this music question, and I, um, you know, I don't want to sound flip about it, but I mean, it took me many, many, many visits to Cuba to you know, deepen my appreciation of the art and music there. But the one thing I would say is it's much broader than we think. Our discovery that there is such a thing as Cuban classical was a revelation, not just what our brothers do, but there was, there's kind of a, you know, there's a, there's a chamber orchestra history. There's some wonderful composers and pianists in the Cuban um, canon. 
And um, there's contemporary, there's some uh, hip hop, which is really interesting. There's woman, woman run hip hop, which is super interesting. Um, mm, that sounds it, like a good movie. It, uh, well, she, there, she's there, amazing. There have been other, there have been other films. Uh, About there's her. one called From Mambo to Hip Hop, which kind of charts some. Anyway, there are there are many many histories, um, and there's a there's a Cuban Bob Dylan type, and there's uh, other great piano jazz pianists. Writers, so it's it's and quite folk, broad. folk singers, and and oh, then of broad. course there's there's Cuban songs. Uh -huh. which is, you know, most people, when they think of Cuban music, think of uh, the Buena Vista Social Club, right. which yeah. is a certain kind of uh, Cuban salsa music. And do you all have uh, your next project ready, or are you still kind of just focusing on birthing this one? Well, I think at this point we're supposed to give you our, you know, our little pitch for the next project and tell people, you know, where the website is and where they can donate. But oh, well, the the yeah, actually, I shouldn't have said birthing. Let me, I'm going to repeat that. The, Do you have your next project ready? Are you interested in doing something yet? Or are you just going to shepherd this to festivals and it's theatrical or wherever it's going to go? I, I would say that uh, we always have a lot of ideas cooking. I'm working on some short projects and Ken's editing for some other people. Um, but the big project right now is, um, is both to get this film out there um, before it's public television broadcast. Um, and also we're doing some kind of great work with organizations that are um, working on diversifying classical music and on really supporting um, music education for all, every kid. Um, regardless of you know where they are, the culture, community, or income level, or whatever. So we're doing a lot of work in that regard with the film also. And I, I should have mentioned that, uh, Ken, you do editing for many projects, including this one, and Marsha, you're the impact manager for this project. So I'm sure it's going to, do, going to go far and deep, um, looking for ways to make it impactful that's, the hope. That, that's our that's our hope. Uh, it's a it's a it's a wonderful story, yes. and I think they're um, hopeful story. And I think they're quite delightful to watch, and the, and, and through them, I think um, certain doors can be open. People get curious in other music, and um, that's our hope. Is there anything I missed that you would like to say about the film, about Cuba, about the brothers, about music, or? Mm. I would encourage. So. Yeah. I would encourage people who love music and culture to take a deeper dive into what's available in Cuba, either online or eventually through travel. Uh, it it takes a long time, in my experience, to really have a deep understanding of a place and of their their music or their art. Um, and I would say again, if you think you know Cuban music because you've seen a film or two, you know. Try again. Go deeper. Go to the record store. Go on Spotify. It, it's it's quite a, a a rich world out there, and because of that particular cocktail that Marsha talked about earlier, the the mix of of the Western classical canon of American jazz of the Afro Cuban rhythms from the the east side of the island, the the particular Cuban cocktail is really like like none other. Um, it, it's not. It's been compared to Brazilian music, but it really isn't Brazilian, but it, it's a similar cultural blend, but it has its own vibration. Thank you. Marsha Jarmel, Ken Schneider, thanks so much for joining CFI Education. My thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks.